Well, welcome everyone. It is so great to have you in the room. I want to thank you for joining us for our very first speaker series event. Um, I'm very excited to be able to bring this programming to you. I would not be able to do it without the absolute generosity of our sponsor, Northern Trust. So I want to take this moment to thank them for sponsoring not only the speaker series, but also our summer programming, our summer institutes and our boot camps. So with that being said, I'd like to start off this evening with our Indigenous Peoples Acknowledgement. As Crystal Bridges in the Momentary, we recognize our role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Caddo, Quapaw, and Osage, as well as the many indigenous caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse, and contemporary cultures of indigenous peoples. We are conscious of the role in colonization that museums have played. As cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous people's past, present, and future. We choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. And without further ado, I would love to introduce you to tonight's speakers. I'm going to start with Carl Joe Williams. Carl Joe Williams is a contemporary African American. Things and painted sculpture from found objects. Williams installation journeys was featured at the Hartsville Jackson International Airport in Atlanta, Georgia in 2002, and his Sculptural Trees Public Art Institution in Materi, Louisiana. Williams is one of the founders of Blights Out, a creative capital supported project in New, York, New Orleans, along with artists Lisa Segal and Imani Jacqueline Brown. Blights Out is a community and artist-led initiative to activate agency and neighborhood development. This initiative was initiated as part of Prospect New Orleans, a large biennial of international contemporary art in the US. Carl is joined this evening by, let me get to my gallery here. By Rashid Duroso. who is a civics program director at Democracy Public Schools, a national network of 22 charter schools founded with the explicit mission of preparing the next generation of change makers. In his role, he coordinates community engagement experiences and K-12 nonpartisan civic education, education curricular materials for over 7,000 children and 900 adult staff members. A graduate of Williams College and the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, Rashid is a lifelong learner who is committed to empowering communities dismantling systems of oppression and discrimination and contributing to the work of building a more empathetic and interconnected world. And they are joined by Ryan Duran, who is a music and arts educator and administrator specializing in strategic program design for K-12 public schools. As an arts education director in the charter sector, he works to support arts teachers and school leadership teams in maximizing the impact of core and extracurricular arts programming and co-creating cohesive dynamic curriculum and pedagogy for each. He also designs and facil facilitates professional development sessions for arts teachers and instructional coaches and is working to ensure the future of music education contains more keyboards, ukuleles, and guitars than ever before. You can keep up with Brian on Instagram at silentbry2004. And so if you will, with your reactions, give them a round of applause, we will get started with tonight's program. All right. And I am going to share my screen.
And Kay, can you let me know if you can see that? See that. Perfect. And I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Can you hear me well? Yes. Good, good. I just want to say thanks for having me. Um, I, I appreciate being a part of this process. Uh, you know, as a former art teacher, um, I'm really excited to be a part of, of some of the work that you are doing. And so it's really important to me to be a part and continue to be a part of how, how, um, how education is evolving. Um, before I get started, I just want to show you a little bit of my work so you can get an idea of the type of works I do. I do a lot of different types of work. Um, but everything is pretty much based in painting. Um, this painting that you're looking at um, is a work that was inspired by an iconic image in the Black community. Um, it's an image that spans the globe as far as uh, traditional Black uh, diaspora. Uh, it's a, a very intimate tradition. It's, and it's an attempt to memorialize uh, the activity amongst Black women of hair braiding, which is a very deep tradition. So braiding is often a political statement in and of itself. You know, it's often uh, seen as uh, a way to instill self-esteem and confidence. So this image is aligning itself with ideas and notions of the divine feminine. And it was important to me when I made it that uh, Black women would see themselves in it and connect to it immediately. Um, but it's interesting because when I, what it's painted on is um, old door palettes. If you look at it closely, you can see that it's actually old cut up doors. And ironically, a friend of mine gave me two of them. So when you give me two of something, I think duality, I think male, female, I think all of these types of ideas because a lot of my work has a, a lot of spiritual connections to it as well. So we can go to the second image. And this one is the polar opposite. Um, this, these are iconic images of black men connecting in social activities. Black men connecting over a Heineken and a Black and Mile and over the tradition, uh, the culinary traditions that we actually help to create in this country of barbecue. And the work is intended to be extremely animated in the sense that this was right about where a joke was about to happen. Um, so this is coming from years and years of personal uh, experience um, and trying to uh, create a work that connected to the divine and masculine as well. And the work is called, you know, I don't need everybody's potato salad. And uh, it was the phrase that was about to happen just before the joke. And you can see his friend is already ready to laugh because he already knows what's going to happen. And that's definitely from my personal experience. So those two pieces are actually companions of, of a sort. Um, you can go to the next piece. This next piece, I would like everybody to kind of just look at it for a moment. For about 10 seconds, I want you to just kind of look at it and just you know, give, get a sense of what this image makes you feel. I'm just going to give it a few seconds for you to look at it. Good. In this piece, this piece was done on a mattress that I found in the streets. Um, it, creating work on repurposed and found objects is super important to the way I think about uh, 
spiritual process, rebirth, and it's a bunch of ideas that, that come to mind. But in this particular piece, I was interested in African-American family. And my intent was to draw people to project their own ideas on to the people presented in the work. People are gonna project their own ideas, assumptions, and they're gonna bring all of that to every work that's made. And in this particular piece, this is not a family, but it was designed to look like a family. Um, those two people are waiting at a bus stop. And it could either be a family or it could be two strangers waiting at a bus stop. So it was really trying to discuss and talk about uh, the Black family and families in general, to be quite honest, but the Black family and some of the things that actually helped to break the family up and why. And the name of the piece is called Waiting because they're both literally waiting at a bus stop. And you can't tell whether it's, whether they're you know married or not. So the piece was designed to be super ambiguous. Okay. So that's a couple of examples of my paintings. And we can talk about some other works later, but I wanted to get into our activity for today. And before I change slides, Paul, I just want to lift up a couple of comments from okay. the chat. Georgia okay. said, like that art. And Shruti said, confusion in the woman's mind. <laughs> Confusion in the woman's mind. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I think the the most uh, I I think one of the most important components of the piece is the fact that they're looking away from each other. They're not engaged at all. And. I really wanted that to be a striking feature of that painting. So it could be confusion. It could definitely be confusion. Thank you. Okay. All right. So what we're gonna do, I, um, I wanted to do an activity that made a huge impression on me back in college. And it was so long ago, but in the process of, of talking about this event tonight, um, it came up and we discussed it. And I just thought it would be really intriguing. So what I wanna do is I really wanted to create small drawings and you don't have to worry, nobody actually has to draw in this. It's just um, really light drawings, um, not abstract drawings where we don't have to actually illustrate anything necessarily. Um, it's this idea of actually looking within and seeing what comes out. So what I'm gonna do is take a word and give you a word and give you a minute to think about that word. And then you're gonna draw an abstract interpretation of that word. Here's an example that I did a little earlier. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. I would love for somebody to just tell me what they think this means. It's, it's a word. I'm not gonna take long, but I'm just curious if anybody could actually say, come up with something. Maybe, Nothing. maybe it's heart. The word is hot. Hot. <laughs> yeah, the word is hot. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. We're going to, we're gonna use art to basically create ideas, to express ideas that are not illustrative. All right, non-representational, nothing recognizable in, in these small drawings. So the first one we're gonna do is we're going to 
take one and we're gonna take 30 seconds per, well, 15 seconds per image. So the first one we're gonna do is actually gonna have two ideas on it, masculine, masculinity and femininity. And we're gonna put it on both sides of the post-it note, okay? So we're gonna have 30 seconds per word. So, I mean, I'm sorry, 15 seconds per word. So since there's two words here, we're gonna have 30 seconds for it. All right. Okay, we can start now. Yeah, I said the word hot for my example. This was hot for my example. I haven't, I haven't, I'm not keeping time. Who's keeping time? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've, I think we're at time. <laughs> I think we're at time. Okay. All right. So we're going to share. Yep. Okay. Let's share. All right. Just curious what we have. Wow. This is exactly where I kind of expected. <laughs> now, this is one of those exercises that's actually fairly predictable. Awesome, that is really cool. It's the kind of thing that makes you think about what are those things in humanity that actually really links us together, you know? But the next set of words are gonna be very, very different, right? So, our next word is dignity, dignity. So we're gonna go 15 seconds on that. Let, let me try to keep the time shoot. Okay, I think that's about time. And the next word is race, race, 15 seconds. Ready, go. Time. Time. Awesome. All right. Our next word is hope. Hope. 15 seconds. Ready? Go. Hmm? Time. Awesome. Great. All right. Can everybody hold their drawings up?
We're going to share our drawings. Can we start with, um, we're holding like a bunch at once. Can we start with one? Like, let's start with dignity. Yeah, let's go with dignity. You've got multiple pages. Let's go with dignity. Let's see what comes up. Wow. All right. See yours. Let me see. It's interesting. So many people have so many different in interpretations. Wow. Very interesting. It's, uh, it's really interesting to know uh, Lynette, Benjamin, Zev, and Lori have very, very similar structures. Uh, and actually mine was somewhat similar as well. Some, some kind of, and, and Sally actually, kind of upright figure of some sort. Mm -hmm. so it was, it's definitely interesting to see that element of rising up. And, yeah. Uh, I see yeah. a similar uh, rising motion. Right. And there's a there's a height there. There's there's you know a lot of it. It's there's a there's a, a lot of things that are high up in the top of the frame. That's really I find that very very interesting. You know. So that that said, it's a great exercise to demonstrate how many different perceptual interpretations that that we have how many different meanings that we have associated with different ideas. Um, and I'm just curious if uh, we could talk about this at some point, uh, maybe later, but uh, I would be curious to know uh, what words were harder than others, if some words were more difficult than others and why, it would be really interesting. Um, but, you know, we can see how art is reflected in people's perceptions and how art expresses the current climate of how we view our world. Um, yeah, I can imagine race being extremely difficult. Um, but it's interesting because, um, you know, as human beings, we can easily connect on some things. And then there's other things that we have a completely different uh, mindset, neurology around. Um, you know, so, so art is, you know, art is a means of, of getting awareness of our thoughts and our understanding and how we can manage our own emotions in, in positive ways. In other ways, relieve stress. In other ways, uh, create methods to communicate better to our students, our family and loved ones, you know. So that said, Sally, I think uh, you might be ready to start. Okay. Um, so a question that we had pondered that I'm gonna drop into the chat was what did you notice when you were doing that activity? Non-representational. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I understand. wanted to write the word also. It's interesting, you know, I think we can have abstract narratives as well. 
it's just trying to interpret it that becomes difficult, you know. I think one person commented, um, uh, hi everyone, I'm Brian. Uh, thank you, Sally, for the wonderful introduction earlier. Um, I just wanted to ch comment on, on some things I heard in the chat or I, I read in the chat is, uh, and I found myself doing this very, very quickly, uh, but, but starting with things that I knew, you know, starting with images, starting with a circle to represent this idea. And then in myself, I found myself hesitating because it was, it was directed to be abstract and non-representational. Um, it sounded like other people were sort of resonating with that same struggle inside. Um, and, and that it was difficult to draw, I saw some one, one person say, difficult to draw such strong concepts, such big ideas, maybe like dignity, hope, things that could be so, you know, differently interpreted and, and, and experienced by different people. Mm -hmm. um, difficult to make that concrete into, a, into an abstract, into a, a, a piece of, of even a, a, you know, Sharpie drawing on, on a post-it, right? Um, so when I think of that, I think, I think wow, you know, yes, it's difficult, but this is what people have done through through the dawn of art, right? The first cave drawing, you know, something inside of that person back then was was saying this needs to be on that cave, you know, and we, we might not know what, you know, but but there was some sort of intuition to say, put the finger in the in the whatever it was and put your, put it on the cave wall. And the rest is history, right? And so from there, we, we move on. But I think there's something very, very sort of um, uh, almost uh, just innate in, in what we just did and trying to represent something very difficult that we all know is real, that we all know is sort of a part of our human experience. But when it comes time to communicate about that or, or even ask ourselves, what do we believe about this and how could we represent this concretely, it becomes very difficult. And so that's what, that's what the charge of activist educators is, is to find ways to engage people in that fundamental processing of who we are as people and how do we now take that information uh, and and try to make the world into a better place, right? Um, so on that, I think that that draws, draws us into the next stage of the of the uh, conversation um, pretty pretty nicely. Um, how do we how do we guide young people? You know, if, if for those of us who are teachers or for those of us who are activists or creative people, how do we guide young people? Because when when we're the teacher in a classroom, or we're the facilitator of a group, we also hold a position of power, right? We also hold a position of, of over. Um, you know, young minds. And so we wanna, we wanna take that power seriously and, and exercise it with responsibility. Um, Rashid, has that, has that been pretty easy to do so far in, in, your, in your experience or what, what, what are your thoughts on this? My experience, it takes a little bit of time, Brian. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rashid once again and um, just really grateful to Sally and the entire organization just for having us here and thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I, I think that especially when we think about the development of agency and ensuring that we're working in a way that helps our students find their power, uh, when we're really looking at how we engage with their questions and how we prepare them to ask questions, there is a power dynamic there that we're constantly navigating. You know, the, the bravery that it takes to actually ask a question of your students honestly and not one that's that's very much, um, you know, there's only, there's there are one or two answers, but one that truly allows them to reflect deeply and share truths that you may not be prepared for. It takes bravery on your part. In the same in the same way, it takes bravery on theirs to actually voice what they're thinking and feeling and holding in their hearts. Um, and so I think as we continue to think about our work as activists, our work as educators, we want to constantly just remind ourselves that any question at any level really demands that we are creating a space for ourselves, giving ourselves grace and saying, well, I might not know this, but this is the first step that I need to take to be the activist I want to be, to have the results that I want to have with my kids. And that same process is happening with our own students. And I would ask folks, you know, you can share in the chat, but as you were doing that previous, previous activity, at what point was there a little bit of hesitation when we said, okay, now hold up your design? Was there that moment of, oh, I don't know how different mine is gonna be from everyone else's. Is it going to deviate from, from everything else? Um, I'll pass it back to you, Brian. Sure, yeah, and just before we, we move on to uh, see Carl's next uh, amazing work, uh, I think one theme that, that comes, that's come up as we've, as we've prepared for this session and that's frequently on my mind is at this specific moment in our history, 
where there's there's so much of an emphasis on raising voices and empowering next generation and and um, you know hearing from a wider variety of, of, of voices through a um, you know through an equity lens and, and so forth. Um, how do we how do we engage in that process in a sustainable and a meaningful way? That's that's going to be authentic and stay authentic to who we are at, at our stage in life, and then and then help students again to, to to come into that process as well. And so I think um, you know thinking through the idea of looking inward for for me and for us, I think in the planning sessions has raised this topic of questions. When we look inward, we're, we're ultimately asking ourselves a lot of questions. You know, sometimes unconsciously, we're even asking these questions. And, and through how we answer those questions, we develop narratives about ourselves, narratives about our communities, about our world, um, that that constantly sort of are informing our daily steps, but also are are um, sort of co-creating the next steps, right? Because we're we're sort of you know on this cycle of defining and redefining as we go through these different moments in time. Um, but this this larger theme of asking good questions, asking asking uh, questions that will lead to further questions, um, and ultimately, if if the goal is to raise the voice of our students, then then a great a great opportunity to do that is through asking a lot of questions, right? And building classrooms and in building group settings in which we work, where questioning is valid, questioning is valued, um, and and the, and that again, we're asking. A, a different set of questions this year than we were last year as, as a sign of progress. And so, so the, the remainder of this presentation, I think, as we as we go forward into seeing more work and thinking about how do we take some of this, this conversation about raising voice, moving forward, uh, asking questions, uh, how do we take this specifically into our different walks and professions in a practical way? I think, um, you know, just just keeping keeping those big ideas in mind is going to is going to help guide that process a bit. Um, but yes, absolutely. Sometimes I think, Rashid, on your note on courage and bravery, sometimes it's not only knowing what question to ask. Sometimes we know the question we need to ask, but you know we're not brave enough to do it, or we, or we need, you know, uh, an environment has not been created in which that that question would be welcome, right? And so, um, those are all great things to think about, both as student and as as teacher in in the, in our various circles. But I, I'm, yeah, I'd be curious. And, and, if you'd like, sorry, go ahead. I, I was actually going to, yeah, I was going to say, uh, what you said really does make me think about how we as adults also need to be brave enough to ask those questions, especially as educators, to be brave enough to ask those questions for our kids. And we should always be thinking that the question is really the stepping stone to advocacy. You know, we can't really come about. We can't go about building the kind of society we want to live in or bringing about the kind of changes we want without first asking why is it this way to whom should i direct this question how come i have not seen x y or z so i i do think that a, a huge part of anything we're talking about when whenever we mention advocacy whenever we mention uh engagement it's really what i don't remember the theme questions um and, and as, as we've mentioned before, I also think there's, there's a level of a personal willingness to step out into the unknown. That's super important. And it's, it's been a pleasure uh, hearing a little bit about what we're about to see next with, with, uh, with Carl's uh, work, um, the next work up. But it's, it's really, really inspiring to me as an arts person and musician to, to see when, you know, when those internal dialogues, when that internal inquiry process manifests in such a way that that engages a community, challenges a community, uh, challenges different age groups within a community, um, because I think when when art can communicate there and when there's that space for art to bring people in and, and let them create their own meaning all in the same space and time, some really, really powerful change can happen. And I think uh, what we're about to see uh, with Carl's next piece is going to illustrate some of that for us. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> I initially wanted to just show the piece, but um, after having so many conversations, I, I thought about uh, in a situation that happened while I was composing the work. And the entire work was literally based on questions, asking, you know, fairly difficult questions because the work was being composed right in the middle of a pandemic and right in the middle of worldwide uh, uh, protests about George Floyd. And, and so um, 
I started to create questions and think about questions and talk to people about the questions and work with the museum about questions. And some of the questions were, how does your family intersect with the American dream? And I'm not necessarily a believer in the American dream, but it was, for me, the American dream was a trigger word. It was a jumping off point for a deeper conversation about what we're doing here and how we're getting along. And initially it was supposed to be uh, a quite a number of high school students that were gonna be in the work. And uh, another, let me, another quick question was, just a second. Another, it was a series of eight questions that were asked. And another one was, what is your economic legacy? Of, what is the economic legacy of your family? And another question was, what are some of the things that are working well and not working well in America? You know, those are three of the questions. It was a, it was a series of, of eight. And uh, so in the process of creating at work, we were kind of going back and forth, trying to craft questions that would ultimately create more of an in-depth conversation. The beauty of it is that it involved young people. And I'm talking about ages 15 to 17, 18. Um, but when they realized that the work was actually um, just opposed against, uh, you know, state sanctioned lynchings or police videos, um, the work was pulled and I had to immediately hurry up and find uh, people in that community to answer those questions. And so I just felt that it was appropriate to, to bring that up and bring that into the conversation because uh, we're talking about being able to uh, have conversations like this and being able to find out and having young people be able to find out where they stand and how they can build on their own ideas and how they can you know, be a part of more activism, uh, be a part of developing the world and pushing humanity forward in a positive direction. And so I think it was important to, to, to mention that. Um, so before we see that video, I'm going to show you some of the video of the young people who did answer those questions. I'm just going to do maybe 30 seconds of that. And then we can, then you can see the, the rest of the work. So Sally, if you have that, you can show that. So that's it. I know, especially from my dad's side who came from the Philippines, the American dream was what they saw advertised all over the Philippines saying like, come to America, you'll have this great life that you could never get in the Philippines. And that's where they kind of really went off and they wanted to build something more for our family. And I think that's what the American dream meant to them was family. My family felt the need to strive for being wealthy and um, being powerful. My family created our own American dream. We grasped the culture that had been passed down to us um, from generation to generation. And we have continued to create our own by loving each other and being there for each other. My mom and my aunt, they are the epitome of the American dream in my eyes. You know, they started off with nothing. When my mom was in Spain, she got very sick, almost died as an infant because she was dehydrated. And um, both of them, my mom and my aunt, worked so hard through high school, you know, and, and college. My grandpa got a job as a mailman. My grandma got a job as a jewelry, a costume jewelry store manager. And, um, you know, they didn't really have much, um, but they worked very, very hard. My mom, got into every single college she applied to, including Ivy Leagues. She went to Miami, University of Miami, because she got a full ride there and was able to stay close to her family. And now she's a doctor. She's an OBGYN. And my aunt travels all over uh, the world on business, and she has crazy connections in all these different industries. And it's just incredible that these two little girls who were born under this communist regime are, have now made themselves to be very successful, happy women. And it's because of this country. You know, had they stayed in Spain? Okay, so you get a, a pretty good idea 
of of what the videos were that was the the concept initially and it was to me it was very very poetic because uh it was important that it was young people that were answering these questions even though they didn't necessarily have the life experience to answer them in 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 ways that you know that would reflect life experience um I think, I think it was important that they were able to start those types of conversations and be able to think more critically about where they were from and how they got to where they, where they were. But at the very last minute, it was all pulled. And so I had to hustle and I had to tap into community resources in that city to uh, be able to find uh, people out of that community to answer those questions and be involved in that in that work and that work was really about building a conversation based on asking good questions and especially in the type of climate that was happening during that time it was really really i felt important to create a much bigger conversation so um we can i guess we can show the video um because i feel like i'll just keep talking you know we can we can we can show the video and this is the piece that wind up being in Jacksonville it was a 42 foot tall uh installation in Jacksonville Florida and a lot of the backgrounds that you see were based in uh, African American traditions of quilt making and also African textiles However, a lot of the uh, images that were used to create the patterns, the African patterns, were what we know now as white supremacist symbols and symbology. Uh, however, what, what was interesting to me is that uh, these symbols don't have that kind of history. When The further you go back, the blacker those symbols get, which is which, what was really, really, really interesting to me was a lot of symbols that we see today that are white supremacist symbols. When you go further and further back in time, you see that it comes from a lot of, uh, a lot of indigenous cultures, um, particularly in, in Africa. So I thought that was a beautiful kind of poetic way to have this conversation. So that said, um, the bottom tier are the, the people from Jacksonville, and the second tier, you can see, if you look closely, you'll be able to see that there are televisions and monitors that are hidden, like, behind um, canvas, and some of them are actual TVs sitting on tables. So you can, uh, you can go ahead and run the video so people can get a better look at it. We are looking at and listening to Carl Joe Williams' fantastic installation as part of the Atrium Project at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Jacksonville, Florida. This Florida ceiling three-story installation by Williams is inspired by the great tradition of African-American quilt makers. Making Great Lives Matter is the name of the installation. Carl Joe Williams is a New Orleans-based multimedia artist. This large-scale project considers the idea of the American dream. <laughs> Those voices you hear other than mine are local Jacksonville residents who have responded to that question and then been uploaded into the work on the ground floor take a look at that here that balance that imbalance is causing most of the major world problems so fixing that is part of my very part of the project asks visitors to respond to various questions about the American dream. Is it a myth? Has their family been able to realize it? What does it mean to them? And then these video projections 
replay their answers. For the future. Um, and I haven't shared this with a lot of people. Oh my God, this is an exclusive. <laughs> um, I would love to take a pocket of Jacksonville. Um, preferably somewhere where I've grown up. Mm -hmm. And I would love to do that. You know, um, and it sounds far you know, but I would love to almost have something similar to um, the Townsend around the Kings Road, Edgewood area. You know, we, I think that that area itself has a lot of rich history. Oh, so you can imagine if you were there, those voices would kind of overlap each other. And when you walked up to each individual piece, you would be able to see it, hear it very, very clearly. And that was that was a beautiful thing about how that work worked out because uh, just wasn't sure, but it actually worked out really, really well. And ultimately, those are the people who replaced the students. And I. I I really appreciate those those people for for coming through. Um, but yeah, so the idea was to actually create a conversation and try to move our humanity forward by actually really kind of peeling back the layers of our existence here to, together and how we can actually create a better world. So it's all about asking the right questions. And I realized that asking the right questions can propel you light years ahead because sometimes it'll force you to think about something that you never ever ever thought about and then of course when you're thinking about something brand new it creates brand new uh brand new circuits in the brain and next thing you know you're thinking about other things so it, it literally expands your world so this idea of asking the right questions um has been a, an important part of my work lately. So I just felt like it was important to bring that little bit of part of the of how that work was created into the conversation. Thank you, Carl, so much for sharing. Um, I'd like to take a minute and just, just think about what we just saw and experienced and have a moment of reflection on it. And then we're gonna do what's called, called a waterfall or a chat waterfall. So I'm gonna ask you a question related to what we just saw. You're gonna type your answer in the chat, but not press enter until I say go. And then they're all gonna waterfall down and we're gonna take some time to read through what, are, what, we've, uh, what are, you know, we're all sort of seeing and experiencing. Um, and so what my, my question is, is if you were to use this work, the work that we just saw, if you were to use it in whatever space you work, whether you're a teacher with students or you're an activist, you know, um, with with different groups or organizing uh, protests, movements, things like that, um, or, or if you're, you know, something, something else, um, how would you use that work? What's what's a question that you would pose to your class or your group about that work? And think about that for a minute. And then when you have a question about that work that you would pose to your group, you can type it in the chat. And then when I say go, we're all going to press uh, enter and we're going to see what kind of questions we have. If you can't think of a question, you could also just write an observation about the work that you're currently sort of uh, resonating with. Um, but I would like to make a, a strategic focus to shift it toward our own space. How would we take this, this work of art? um and and use it to facilitate a conversation in our own corner of 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 the world take about 15 seconds to think through either observations or questions for our groups and then we'll uh, i'll say go and you can press go and press enter And I'm gonna count down from five, then press enter, and we'll see the chat waterfall do its thing. Five, four, three, two, one. Press enter.
I'm seeing one of my personal favorites. What do you notice about this work of art? Just keep it open-ended. Let people bring themselves to a very open-ended question. It's always a, way, a good way to open up conversation. How are the stories you heard similar and different from your own vision of the American dream? Yep. What inclusivity, what inclusivity did you find in this work? How could you connect with that work? All right, so we have some great questions in here. Uh, we also asked uh, before the session to bring some questions. Like I think we said the five uh, most frequently asked questions. Some of them were like, where's your hall pass? Uh, why are you late to class? And others were like, you know, where can you, you know, support this with evidence from your writing or depending on what you get. But again, the, the next portion of this is also gonna think about as we develop habits, how do we develop habits? And then how do we use the power of habits to build inquiry and creative culture in whatever space we're working, right? So if, if our current habits are, where's your hall pass? When's the last time you went to the bathroom? Why are you late, right? And how can we, how can we make some habits about asking higher leverage questions to get those voices to come out, you know, that, that might not come out right away, but if we strategize the questioning and scaffold it a bit, we could certainly, um, you know, bring some more voice into it. And Brian, are you ready for me to share back to the PowerPoint? Yes, I think so. Rashid, anything, anything to check to, um, we're good to go? Okay, cool. Let's, let's hop back, back to the PowerPoint. Does anyone want to share, actually, before we go there, does anyone want to share either on something uh, about the work? I feel like we had a, a really awesome illustration of the power of questioning delivered fully to a work of art in a community. What are, I'd, I'd love to hear just one person from the group share what their experience was or, or anything that's resonating with them right now. Anyone, any brave souls want to come out and raise their voice? See what I did there? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kel Schaefer. Go ahead, Kel Schaefer. Uh, Kelly, sorry, I should change it on there. But um, yeah, I just, I'm just blown away. Like I want to, I would like to be there and like spend a lot of time with it. It seems like, like you could spend a whole lot of time. <laughs> There's so much to see. I love um, all the colors and the patterns and, um, and the questions, just like a ripple effect of questioning for sure. Mm. And I love the, the personal narratives from, from the community where it was placed. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I, can, I can relate to spending a lot of time there. It's, it's, it's truly, it's massive in size too. So when you look up, it's got this over all encompassing sort of feeling, you know, um, uh, which I think speaks to the, to the nature of the ideas as well. Um, all right, let's, let's pivot over to the PowerPoint and see how can we now take some of these things um, you know, that, we, that we've talked about uh, regarding looking inward, raising your voice, uh, you know, speaking up for very important things that, that you know, have, have a long history and, and no, you know, singular, you know, um, solution, uh, but rather a multifaceted complex solution that takes the engagement of many, many communities and, uh, and you know, people. Um, so on that front, here, here's uh, Rashid and I's attempt to capsulize some sort of principles that, that might apply to a teacher's classroom or, or uh, an activist space or, um, you know, arts, arts education folks, whatever, uh, whatever space you're in. I think this is a good sort of a few points to consider for creative teams, right, of all, of all kinds. Uh, and Sal, you can go ahead and advance. Yep. So this is called Five Habits for Growing Inquiry in Creative Communities. The first one being, so you can go ahead. First one being to model curiosity, right? So anyone involved in the arts knows that they became an art teacher because something, you know, something spoke to you as an artist, as, as someone who created art beforehand. So it's so important sometimes when we enter into that power of, of, of having a, a, you know, influence over other people, especially younger people, uh, to model so much, right? To model, model behavior, model, model values, um, but certainly model curiosity. You know, if, if, if you're hoping for larger, you know, more profound or deeper questions in, in your, um, you know, how, how are you doing that personally? How are you doing that for, for the class? You know, and, and do they, are they connecting with those things? Rashid, anything else on, on curiosity? I, I just think it's so important for us to constantly cultivate a sense of wonder 
in our in our scholars and our students in the groups of individuals with whom we interact. Um, I think it's very easy sometimes, especially in the education space, for you know young people to equate having all the answers and not necessarily understanding that asking questions is a, a form of maturity. It's a sign of maturity. Being curious is not immature. And so I think we need to continually reinforce for folks that this is, this is a part of a growing process. Um, and so when you don't actually ask questions, when you're not maintaining a sense of wonder about the world around you, you're not growing. And it's actually a step in the opposite direction of showing maturity. Because when you ask those questions, when you're turning over every stone, sometimes you get those answers that you weren't looking for, ones that make you uncomfortable, ones that make you unhappy, but you're arriving closer to the truth. Um, so it's just important for us as adults to constantly, as Brian said, pave, pave the way for our students to help them know, our students, colleagues, teammates, help them understand that it's okay and important for them to really be asking all of the questions at all kinds of different levels. This, this can also become very practical when it comes to breakdowns in culture, whether it be a uh, you know, behavior disciplinary system that, that is not achieving its desired effect. Um, you know, are the adults modeling a posture of curiosity about the students' worlds and what they're bringing into the classroom? Um, um, you know, certainly certainly a, a great way to, to also see curiosity as, as a way to build relationships and, and sort of you know, navigate breakdowns when they do happen. Um, Yep, absolutely. So I just see uh, Ms. Westfall Edwards comment. Uh, talk about it every class. Yep. Um, so the next one, Sally, if we could go forward, the next one, uh, again, this is another habit for growing inquiry in a, commun a creative community, is going to be to normalize inquiry, right? So make it make it something that's not an option, right? And, and, and this, this is what I see a responsible use of the power that we do have as as people, you know, shaping minds and 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 making decisions that affect large groups of, of people. Um, you know, if we can normalize that the culture in the classroom is simply one of inquiry, it's one where everyone has to ask questions, you know, and whether that whether or not people share it publicly is a different thing. But but, you know, through a practical technique like a journal or something where there's a daily opportunity to, to answer a prompt or and then to write your own prompt, right, to write your own question, but something very practical that you do build into a system into a classroom um, that can that can really help to up the discipline of just being curious and posing questions, posing, posing more uh, insightful questions each day based on new content that we're learning across you know along the way um, that that certainly has applications to both the arts and and to civics um, and, and, and social change and, and so forth um, Rashid anything on, on uh, normalizing definitely um, just when we think from the civics lens how important again and this was mentioned previously but how important it is to have students asking questions throughout the day um, I think, again, it, it is at times uncomfortable for the person who's being expected to answer those questions to hear them, but are you creating a space where students can ask questions about why there's a certain procedure set in place? And are they asking questions about why there's a policy that's been set in the whole school? Are they asking questions about why certain things happen in their communities and not others or whatever the case may be? Are we actually encouraging them to ask the kind of questions that would allow them to say, well, now that I've seen this, I can't look away. Now that I've seen this, I need to understand how this is. What can I do? The next question. You know, how do I do it? The next question. And so to the extent that we can really allow ourselves to step away from this role of I'm the arbiter of all wisdom, of all knowledge, all forms of knowledge, and the holder of information. But someone who is also here to guide you along the work to ask questions. Um, I really the the There's something unspeakable in there. I mean, you could call it. That's the only way that we can really prepare our young folks. Come on, Rashida. Someone's off of mute, and I, it's hard. It's hard to understand what you're saying. We fix it now. Okay, Rashid, can you repeat the last part? Yes, thank you, Brian. I, I think the biggest part for us is making sure that we are teaching our students to become the kind of change makers that they are capable of being right now and cultivating the habits that will only continue to compile and mature as they get older so that they're actually having a greater impact on a larger scale. 
I'd actually like to open this next one up to the group. This is um, the next one is going to be uh, it's explore to strategize. And I, I played with the words here a bit. Uh, initially, it was explore and strategize, but I do see another level of intention where there's a, there's a phase in our artistic creation where we're exploration, where we're exploring, or where we're you know um, any sort of creative process. Um, and then there's a place where exploration is sort of leading us to a certain decision and, and we make a decision and at the moment we put something on the canvas we're now we're now engaged in exploration but also in strategizing about what's the next step based on what i just did what comes first second and third to, to achieve the you know the outcome that i want to achieve with the work so um I'm, I'm curious i'd love to just hear i feel like you know we're talking a lot but we have a lot of other people who who can talk as well so let's share the voice a little bit what does this how does this apply to your work how would you uh, engage in both exploration and strategy with your work? And how do they, how do they feed each other? One thing that I, I frequently use in classes and in, in, in uh, PDs is, is starting with open-ended questioning and getting to more of a focus, right? So an open-ended question might be something like, what do you notice? Because that's going to, again, yield to a large sort of cross-section of, of, of responses from the group. And then if there's a certain thing I want to get to, like, all right, well, how does, how does you know, color and, and shading represent, you know, something in this work? Uh, you know, we, we get more strategic with the with the things that we want to pull through, right? Um, Rashid, anything on 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 that side in terms of uh, exploration or strategizing with uh, with a, with a larger vision here? I, I I immediately start to think a lot about in classrooms when we do idea webs with our scholars um, or whenever we're trying to activate prior knowledge. I think a big piece of that is figuring out what the boundaries of our understanding are. And so when we establish, you know, you'll put one key word up on the board and say, tell me everything you know about it. And the students start, you know, putting all that information out there. That helps us as educators and from the educator lens, it helps us better understand, okay, this is, this is where they're experts in their content area. And here's where there are gaps, you know, this is where there were some blank spaces. And I think so far as being an activist, it's the same as resource mapping, actually asking what is here, you know, instead of kind of coming in with this plan, I'm going to change the community, I'm going to make it better, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Well, you haven't really asked what members of the community need, and you haven't actually asked what's missing or what's, what's already present that we can actually support and build upon. So I think when we think about our activism or our education, it's, it's this exploration, as Brian has mentioned, with a very clear purpose. And sometimes the purpose becomes clear after the fact. You know, you, you figure out your path after you've done a little bit of exploring and feeling around. But ultimately, we know that it can't just stay in that stage of asking all these questions. It's got to translate into action. Um, so I, I think there's a weird... Uh, and beautiful cyclical nature to it, where it's like, we've got to explore to actually have a concrete plan, but you definitely should not have a concrete plan without having spent some time exploring. And I think I think the danger here is in falling too far into either extreme, right? Too, too quick to strategize without enough exploration or too long to explore and a timely decision, you know, should be made and acted upon. And, and, and you know, that's where the opportunities are either activated or, or, or not, you know? Um, Let's, let's move on to the next slide, please, Sally. Right, so this, this, this piece comes in um, just about collecting and activating data, right? So, so thinking about what, what is definite, how do we know something for sure? Um, what do we know about communities that we work with? What do we know about individuals that we work with? And, and having a means by which we can actually collect that data, not just to collect data, but, but to actually activate it, to use it for a purpose, right? And so, so really being um, almost scientific in a way about, about this, this change, right? Or, or about, about this, this, um, 
creation or vision that, that we're looking to uh, to bring into the world. Right? Uh, there's there's tremendous power both in collecting the data and and also and also activating it. And then oh, finally, yeah. on this last one, um, sorry, yeah, Rashid, go ahead. <laughs> Just, just um, to add to what you said, Brian, I think that this this connects really beautiful with this idea, beautifully uh, with the idea of exploring to strategize, um, because it feels like this is in that middle stage where we're exploring, we're collecting the data, we're activating the data, and then we're developing a strategy based on that data. And it's so important that we also uh, revisit the way we think about it, because I, I know that in some contexts, when I hear the word data, the last thing I also think about is a creative process, but I think there there actually is a, a the two complement each other beautifully, because it's almost like the more we know, the more we don't know. The more we actually have questions about, well, why are these numbers this way? What are these numbers illuminating, or whatever the case may be? Because we know there's qualitative and quantitative, um, but nevertheless, when I, what I'm why am I seeing what I'm seeing that is in front of me? And what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Great points as well. I, th I think this this last one is going to also sort of wrap that up and, and, and sort of comment on, on what you just said, Rashid. But this last one, if uh, Sally, if you could please advance, um, just just click it once for this one, or actually twice. There's a, there's a quote that I do want to keep hidden for the first part of this. Um, but this last one is called "Craft and Activate Mystery." So this last habit of of engaging with mystery in an intentional way. This quote is from Albert Einstein, and he says, uh, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. And if we get really sort of granular and think about what happens even when we watch a movie that we really love or a TV show or, or a experience a, you know, a work of art, um, you know, there's something that draws us in. There's something that, that's suspenseful about the piece and mysterious that, that, that is very captivating. And, 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 it, and it keeps our attention to want to know more. And, and the, the, the process of internal questioning, what is, that, what is that thing I see in the distance? Who is that voice? What is that? What's gonna happen next in this song? When is, when is this, you know, when's the bridge gonna come? All these things that are sort of uh, driving our questioning without us even knowing it right? This is how we get engaged in things that are new to us, right? And we can use the, this idea of crafting and activating mystery, being intentional with, you know, how fresh are our classrooms? How fresh are our, our, our opportunities when we have to influence a group or to, to speak to a room? How fresh are we bringing ourselves to it? Have we, have we connected to the wonder that Einstein is talking about here, this fundamental emotion? Have we experienced that within ourselves? Are we inquiring of ourselves um, so that so that we, we are moved to a place of, of believing in our own voice of our own mission um, before we try to get others on board you know and, and if we haven't I would say you know there might be a step in there where, where we need to exercise caution before sharing it but um, there's also the process of sharing can help us get there right so it's a balance but um, there's certainly some tremendous power I think especially with young people who I think are, are a little bit more comfortable or can be more comfortable with mystery than, than, um, than some of the more elders, you know, in, in the, in the, in the groups. But um, yeah, there, there's a certain childhood wonder in here that I think I'm trying to get to. Uh, but Rashid, I'm wondering if you have any other, any closing thoughts on this last one? Yes. Um, thank you, Brian. I, I think immediately of just the, the work that a powerful hook in a lesson can do. If you ask that one question or you show them that one image that's kind of, kind of strange or you give them that one challenge that seems kind of impossible and it inspires, I think, especially in young people, they, they tend to look at mysteries and challenges as, as something to conquer. You know, it, it, it activates them in a way that I don't necessarily think we as adults always feel as activated, but when you put a puzzle in front of a child, um, there is that innate desire to just, I want, I want to figure this out. I want to explore. And I think it links to the idea of play and creativity. Um, and so we should continue to encourage different types of play, I guess, redefine playing as just experimentation and exploration, as that allows our students to really develop the capacities of asking the kind of questions they need or uh, taking risks, because that's the only way that they're, they're truly going to grow. And I even think, even as an adult, um, you know, Brian, you mentioned this earlier, but I'm thinking over the last couple of 
weeks when all these new series on Netflix, and I'm not even a big TV person, but you get clickbait or you get a uh, squid game or whatever other show. And then I'm not necessarily interested in the acting or the story, but there's a mystery that I'm, I'm just actually so invested in seeing it play out that I'm watching five, six episodes thinking, I don't really like the acting. I don't really like this. I just need to finish this because I need to understand what's going on. And I think there, there's just something to be said, as you said, about structuring activities in a way that gets other people to say, well, this may be really challenging and this may be tough, but I, I just need to see this through. I just need to understand. I'm that deeply invested in whatever this mystery is, whatever this challenge is, that even if it doesn't turn out the way that I had expected or I wanted, I know going back to me watching those shows, I, I guessed the wrong way multiple, multiple times, but, the fact of the matter is when you get to that answer, you say, okay, now I understand. And I also maybe have established some kind of schema for me to approach the next one, whether it's a challenge or another waste of time, you know, TV show, whatever the case may be, you are pushing yourself to say, well, I remember the last time this happened. So this time I'm going to approach it in this way. So, yeah. I think, I think too, just the repetitive nature of it, 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 it brings to mind the idea of themes in, in, in a piece of music or even an artwork, but like any, any idea that repeats a theme throughout a novel, when, when that theme comes back and back and returns, you know, before it was a theme, it was just the first introduction of that idea, right? And, and that idea was, was captivating enough for the author to make it into a bigger development of the idea of, of the theme, right? And on that note, I would love to see if anyone's brave enough to take their Sharpie, if they have one, and uh, follow me. I'm actually gonna color my Sharpie on my screen right now. So I'm gonna color in this thing and I've made my screen, my camera darker. And now on the countdown of five, we're all gonna wipe them off. One, or five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna have to keep working on mine. Should have should have used a dry erase. But the 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 the, the lesson, the, the connection here is it's it's inc it's been incredibly liberating for me personally as an educator and an artist to not have everything have to mean something. And I think artists know this well, but I think the more that we can create experiences that are, are just what they are in even the 30 second window of class, um, we can open kids up to the idea of not everything has to have meaning, but we are an instrumental part of creating that meaning with whatever we encounter. Yeah. So then in summary, uh, Sally, if we could advance to the next slide, this is just all on one, one slide, feel free to take a screenshot and, and keep this for, for the road. Um, but we just we just talked through five habits, right? For, for, for growing inquiry, uh, just to summarize, we have modeling inquiry, or sorry, modeling curiosity, normalizing inquiry, explore to strategize, collect and activate data, and craft and activate mystery. Sally, if you can press, press that button one more time. I just wanna make sure if, if people are getting a screenshot, they're, um, they're uh, they're gonna get the full image there. There there it comes. Cool. And on that note, I think you know we've we've talked about some some um, some big picture ideas, a, a few works of art that, that have been incredibly moving, and some some practical sort of habits for for bringing some of these questioning strategies out in our in our creative spaces. So um, Sally, I'm gonna turn it back to you and um, and hear what we have next. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. And um, so we have reached the end of the presentation part of our speaker series. So now what I'd like to do is open up the floor to everyone for questions, thoughts, 
And please, by all means, come off mute. Raise your voice. Mm -hmm. It was great. I, I really enjoyed the idea of, of uh, growing inquiry. I don't teach anymore, but I still work with a lot of young people in my projects. And, and I'm always working with people, you know, with young people. And I'm always trying to figure out ways to, to uh, actually kind of water their, their curiosity. And um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So this has been really informative and uh, it's, it's been great to actually hear hear what you guys have had to say about it. And even though we've been working together, it's been very, <laughs> very informative. So I really do appreciate um, the work you, you've done. So it's been awesome. So I'm still trying to, I'm, 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 I'm feeling like I'm going to um, utilize a, a lot of these ideas and just, even though I don't teach anymore, I'm constantly working with young people. So it's, it's been great. I'm curious if there's, <clears throat> if there's, <clears throat> sorry, I'm curious if there's an insight or a strategy that any of the educators in the room uh, either picked up from the session or felt like there was some validation for a practice that you have embraced. Um, but very, just curious to see how this might get turnkeyed and implemented in work that is being done with students in particular, but any activists or artists, please feel free as well to dive in. <clears throat> but I'm just very interested in hearing, you know, how this may translate into your practice. I, I would like to say something. I'm Kay, I'm a museum educator at Crystal Bridges Museum. And your um, steps, your habits reminded me of a technique we use called see, think, wonder. Um, we have the students see the art, then think about what that art is um, maybe saying to them or make, causing them to feel and then taking them further into the future and asking them what, what does this then make you wonder? And um, Sometimes that wonder leads the students into places of um, problem solving. We, we never know, but, that, but your steps reminded me of that. So thank you. Glad that that was, was uh, resonating with you. Okay. Is there anyone not involved in education directly, but might be involved in more of like a community organizing uh, role or, or uh, maybe a policy role of any sort, but I'd love to hear maybe some voices from outside the classroom as well. I also saw that Zev, you had unmuted yourself a couple of times. So we also want to create a space for you to share. I was, uh, I have nothing specific, but more this idea of data and a connection with uh, Carl Joe Williams work, getting the American dream and kind of incorporating data. So I, it's not a, it's not a tangible fleshed out thought, but this idea of data and how data can be used in examining art and in creating art. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very interesting con concept of, of me trying to work with a lot of different people and trying to create a conversation. Um, and I've, I've been there quite a few times, even with Lights Out, um, just trying to collect data and, and trying to actually apply the data and, and some of the work that we were doing in the city at the time. So I just feel like a lot of the information that was shared today could be applied in so many different components of life. Um, from raising kids to <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of different uh, places that we could actually uh, try to grow our inquiry and, and, you know, get our young people to be very 
uh, inquisitive about the world that we're that we're living in. So for me, it's all about constantly questioning them and throwing questions at them. Um, so that's where my mind is going. It's just continuing this journey. I've been reading a lot about questions, so I'm just thinking more about it, especially after having this presentation. So. I have one question for the group. Would anyone be interested in doing one more post-it activity to close out? Yeah? All right. I'll let, I'll let one of my colleagues choose the word this time. It was fuzzy wuzzy. Fuzzy wuzzy. <laughs> There's the word. <laughs> fuzzy wuzzy. Here we go. Ready? 10 seconds. Countdown. 10. Go. <laughs> and sharpies down put them on off the screen fuzzy wuzzy yep see how united we are see <laughs> it's a beautiful thing <laughs> awesome. awesome i like, I like <laughs> lynette's I like Lynette's. It's it's like the abstract and the representational all at once. Yes. yes. The cluster of stuff. <laughs> right. That's right. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carl and Brian and Rashid, for a fabulous session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I am dropping into the link for the survey. So if you will, please give me the honor of filling out the survey for tonight. If you have not already dropped into the chat your name and email address, if you need PD credit, please do so before you leave so I can make sure you get a PD certificate. And with that, I will say good night.